Katya, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to see what I can share my screen and hopefully that works. Technology is not with me this week, so <clears throat> and I should start. Let's make sure we start at the beginning. Um, view present presentation mode. Can everybody see this one? Is this visible? Perfect. Perfect. Excellent. So Katya asked me to uh, present some of the work we've been doing in Bath for a while, modeling norms. And that's a, in this context, a social construct, but mainly in the area of uh, multi-agent systems and how we went from norms to policies and then from policies into laws and how they all interlink as social constructs and how we can then model them but also verify them. And I think that's where the links are with uh, the things you've been just mentioning, but also if those systems are running, how we can make sure that at runtime, they actually also work accordingly. And if they don't, because people using them, but then actually they can be flagged up as we go along. Um, so briefly, uh, I am a, the director of training for our AI center, in doc, um, doctoral training center, Art AI. Um, looking at sort of the interplay within social sciences, engineering, and computer science, AI, and building the, ideally in a sense, the next generation of AI algorithms and applying them in a responsible way and looking at regulation standards in that sense. So my motivation from starting my PhD was to uh, look at what I tend to call knowledge-driven AI. So looking at how humans reason and to some degree automate it, encode that human expertise so that other people or more people can use it and not relying on a single person or a small group of people so that it can be automated. Looking at verification, I always very much enjoy the more theoretical side of it and being able to prove that something is working. But at the same time, transparency or possibly explainability where there's a bit of a link between the two is that it's clear what the system is doing rather than a very black box approach as in the computer says this and then why does the computer say this and finding ways of explaining why something isn't working or is indeed working and predominantly the work that i've been doing uh, evolves around um, answer set programming so not active server pages but uh, answer set programming as a declarative program mechanism of modeling that uh, human expertise and human decision making. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with answer set programming, I gave a very, very two whistle stop tour of it. So the idea um, in contrast to Prolog, it's very much model driven, not query driven. Um, it's not proof driven. So you generate the models of all the things that are true in your search space and you represent the solutions uh, as your models. Um, what we tend to use to compute those models um, is what we call answer set solvers or ASP solvers, and probably at the moment CLASP uh, from the University of Potsdam is probably one of the leading ones within that. Um, syntax, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but you have A being the head of the rule, B and C's together form the body, and you almost read it, if the body is true, then therefore standards influence A should be true as well. Where not is seen as negation as failure and we're using closed world assumption that and unless it's proven, it's considered false. I should also point out if you have any questions during the talk, please interrupt me and ask the question if something isn't clear. So in answer set semantics, we are looking for a minimal truth assignment that's also consistent such that all rules are satisfied and what tends to be used is called the gelfond lifshitz redux to get away from the negation as failure and then computation so moving then on from that very very short uh, description of answer set programming to multi-agent systems uh, if you look at human and virtual agents uh, so mixed society uh, interacting with each other you want them to be interacting with ideally some autonomy. There may be rules, even if we operate within a society, there will be rules and regulations, but also norms 
queuing, for example, it doesn't mean it's written in the law, but people just do it. And otherwise, if you violate that norm or don't follow or subscribe to the norm, you're either seen as an outcast, there may be some social enforcement taking place. And that's something we want to bring into social technical systems where you have humans and agents working together and building in that type of autonomy for agents to decide on whether they want to follow these norms or regulations as they see fit and finding a reason why they would not adhere to it. So in that sense, if an agent and humans often are much more useful if you have them working together so, uh, so that each of them can work on the tasks they're really good at and leave others for, for, for other agents that are better suited for it. They can delegate tasks, they can communicate, coordinate, negotiate, but that also requires organization. It's not just a free for all. You want to start seeing how things evolve over time. And typically in a multi-agent context, we're talking about this sort of sensing what's happening in the environment. What have the other agents done in the meantime? Then they deliberate, deliberate um, on what the agent itself is going to do, and then they're going to act, which may or may not have an impact on the environment and all of those agents interacting with each other accordingly. And then we want to build a structure on top of that so that it is clear from participating agents who's going to do what, who is going to be responsible for certain aspects, who's allowed to do something. And that sort of organization can then be very wide val and validated to make sure that the system is working as intended, whether it's humans or uh, software agents in there. And that allows us then to build those social structures we humans tend to use to regulate our um, societies and building societal norms in there. So going to the definition of a norm, it's an informal or formal constraint of an action, things one is meant to be doing, is allowed to be doing, and is used to guide, control, or regulate proper or acceptable behavior within a society or a group of uh, people subscribing to those norms and are meant to follow them. In that sense, norms tend to be, as a concept, a lot more less rigid than, for example, laws, which have much more of an enforcement structure embodied within that. But you can almost see one leading to the other. So. This can then be formalized in what we tend to call a normative framework. So it's a set of rules that allows to describe correct or preferred behavior and also incorrect action so that agents know that they're obliged to perform a certain action. Otherwise, a penalty or a sanction will be levied. And also the normative framework or the institution that is sometimes referred to will record the normative structure of the organization. It will keep track, sort of log of what's going on normatively. Uh, so a set of rules that interpret some, but not necessarily all of the agent's actions. Some of them may be outside of the scope of a particular normative framework, or an agent may be interacting in multiple uh, of those um, normative frameworks. And it's sort of, in that sense, it sits between the agent and the environment where the normative framework senses what happens, acknowledges the actions that are taking place and passes them on to the environment. And you have also the agent's actions that are not recognized uh, by the uh, normative framework itself. But you can have multiple of them. You can aggregate them. You can start playing with them and putting them together where agents interacting with multiple ones in some of them and all of them give us that, in, that rich structure we see in society. We all operate in different contexts where different rules apply, different ways of how we should act. And that allows us by using those normative frameworks to differentiate between the different contexts in there and allow the agent to reason about what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate at any given time. So some examples, you. Uh, possibly find in daily life, queuing, which is a very social construct, greetings, and those greetings can be quite different depending on the culture, conferences on how one should review papers, for example, what are the processes one should 
in theory adhere to, but then going sort of more in the, the legal sense, you have national, international laws which could have an interplay with each other, where one tends to, in some cases, be more important, more dominant than the national law, and where you get almost a hierarchy of, of institutions or regulatory bodies, or business policies where companies need to adhere to certain policies in order to say that they are performing or abiding to the law, for example. And then you can start uh, modeling those. Um, so if you want to model that within the declarative language, um, you can start um, doing that by normative facts permission up here. So the agent is allowed to do a certain action, is obliged to do a certain action before something else happens. And that can be an action, but that can also be a certain state that the institution reaches. Otherwise, there is a penalty um, associated with it. But then there's also the concept of um, empowerment. Often enough, we want to make sure that our institutions, the normative frameworks, indicate what is be seen um, by the by the setting. Um, and in multi-agent literature, you often find the example of all priests um, consecrating a marriage. So anybody can say the same words, but unless you're ordained being a minister or a priest, it won't have any impact. You can just perform without any consequences. And that's been embodied by the uh, concept of power. So, and then apart from that, and I've gone too far. Yeah. What you then also want is since a lot of those laws, norms, constructs are domain specific, you also want to have the domain uh, facts represented within that normative state so that you can reason about whether something is applicable or not at any given time um, in there. And the way to model that is using uh, a function called counts as. So if you have your actions being able to be performed by the, action, by the agents, that will then be interpreted by the normative framework as normative actions. And the reason for that is if I raise my hand in an auction, that will mean one thing, if I raise my hand in a class, that will again have a different interpretation. And that's what the countess mechanism uh, wants to represent, that any external action gets interpreted within the normative context. And then using that of the set of actions, we can use normative facts to determine our normative state, which are represented by fluence, which are true for as long as they haven't been terminated once they've initiated and the, the state keeps track of those. So fluid is true if present, it's false otherwise. Comes again with the, the close world assumption. An inertial fluent uh, gets uh, initiated by a certain action and we specify that with our normative framework or gets terminated if something happens within the normative setting as well. And it will keep on being true for as long as it's not terminated. And then we also have non-inertial fluence, which allow us to provide a mechanism of representing state conditions, a sort of way of formalizing different compositions of those fluence and normative fluence that could hold or not true to perform conditions on our state. So making it all work, uh, we have um, our sets of fluence, a set of our actions, we have our relations of concepts and consequence, and they will provide us a labeled transition system, starting from our normative framework in the initial state, every time an action takes place, an external action, the state will move on and be keeping track of that. And if you visualize this, this is our environment where the agent perform actions, and they get interpreted into our normative framework as such. And each time step, this goes along. So, so while writing this either as a mathematical model using functions and relations and, and get a state transition system or coming up with a computational mechanism of uh, using ASP, uh, really works and it's computational but then we notice that if you start writing it from a software engineering perspective writing the asp 
can be quite tedious and quite repetitive. So what we did is we built an action language on top of it that sort of abstracts a little bit away from the ASP so that a lot of the, the repetition of defining fluence and everything isn't done by the programmer or the designer of the normative system. And that allows us to provide types for our predicates more easily, defining our fluence and making sure that each of those fluents gets the right, at least the description, the declaration of power and permission, and we can more easily in semi-natural language start saying that a certain action generates another action, for example, initiation and termination. So from a user perspective, an action language really helped us. It makes it just more manageable than going through an ESP program. But apart from that, semantically, there is actually just a sugar coating for it. So in terms of implementation, we have our install, we translate it into ANS Prolog, which is the input language for, for CLASP. We send it to Klingo and CLASP and create our answer sets. And then we can start visualizing it and getting our traces, showing, finding out whether we have violations, whether we can add extra queries to it to see whether we had all the agents performing, adhering to the norms or whether the norms were broken and start thinking about all of those concepts there. It has a Python front end. Um, we have a compiler that takes install to, to the ASP program and the answer sets are delivered using a language called JSON that allows us then to be used as a machine readable format for visualization uh, on the basis of that. So that's a practical input. And then we started building again a system that allows us to run this um, as, a, as a web service as well so that we can start querying things more easily in a runtime system. But of course, like with all software engineering projects, things are not necessarily designed as you want. You make mistakes, the concepts don't really work, you want to be able to debug it and find out what the mistakes are. But while one can do that, wouldn't it be nice if we can actually automate that? And that's where we started looking at, at revision and using a system called inductive logic programming within ASP to actually ask the program to repair itself. So if we take a quick example here, we have uh, norms um, for an agent sharing example. We have three agents, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, who want to be sharing files with each other with the purpose that at the end of the exercise, all of them have all the files together. And the rules are that you should only receive a file if you shared before. So initially, you want to be able to be sure that everybody shares with everybody. Otherwise, um, you have um, what tends to be called the tragedy of the commons where people don't share or want everything for themselves. So active parties find themselves initially in a situation that they have several blocks or several parts of the file. And to share a copy, they have to share a copy before they can download their own copy and hold it. If we could write it. Uh, using ASP. So if you've shared my share, then you receive the permission to download. If you have downloaded uh, your block or your file, assuming you had the block and it was real and the condition there, then you shared, which would then take that permission away, ideally. So so what would happen in a situation where you start designing it? The designer writes the ASP formalization or uses install to write it and will generate a set of use cases, sort of test-driven development. This is, if this runs, this is what should come out of it. So a scenario plus expected outcome. And then you use those use cases to run your system and hope that the outcome matches your expected behavior. If it doesn't, you know something has gone wrong with your modeling and you can then use theorem, theory revision to revert back and see what, this is my current program. This is what I want to have. Please revise my program in such a way that I do get the outcome I wanted. And if you do that for all the use cases, ultimately you reach uh, a system that works for all the given use cases. So we have our designer here. We have our normative framework, which we've written. We have our set of use cases and then we send it to a learning algorithm, which then comes back with suggested revisions 
it's not a full automated cycle. There's a human in the loop to work out which revisions are indeed um, necessary. So if we go to our sharing block example, imagine this is what we've written. And there's some issues there because we forgot um, deliberately to put in some extra permissions. And that's the thing we want to try to uh, evaluate. So we have a use case. Let's imagine this use case at the starting point, Alice uh, downloads from Bob, so he get, she gets X3 from Bob. Uh, we introduced the concept of a VIP agent who just can receive at leisure. Bob shares with uh, Charlie and so on and so on, and as time goes on. But here, you notice that Alice received two blocks. And based on what we said is, since Alice is not a special agent, she shouldn't receive two files unless she had shared one. So we have something like, Alice, this should have come up as a violation. So something is wrong with our initial model. So then we can start looking at it. So we have our set of observations, our base theory, the things we know are correct. We have the model that we know there's a mistake in there. We have our use case output, input, the state of our uh, thing we want to test, and the outcome we hope to derive from it isn't, de isn't derived. So we want to make sure that we change our theory, our NT, in such a way that we do derive what we wanted in the first place. And that's where uh, we use a, a system called TAL, written by uh, Domenico Corapi from Imperial College as part of his PhD, who looked at his PhD topic wasn't about multi-agent systems, it was about ILP, looking at a way of building an ILP system that could, using answers at program, revise uh, a program using a set of use cases. And he applied that uh, on our multi-agent scenario, where it's a clear language description on how your language could look like. And then the designer can then expect what the ILP program returns to him or her. And the main point for that modeling, and I won't go into a lot of detail in there, is what they use. They're using uh, mode declarations. So modeling your set of rules on how your program should look like. So we, for, for the ASP program, we know that we have actions in the body occurring and that that re initializes a fluent, for example. So we know how the structure of our program would be, and we can use that to help the search for an improved program to go and find the right thing. So what we here say, mode B, is that in a body, a, a part of a new rule, of an improved rule, there can be a bird, a, a bird predicate, for example, in this particular case. And it can be added with a, a variable. So if we do this, we have a set of um, what happens in terms of program. It takes the original program and makes all of those rules into abducibles, making sure that it's clear which rules could potentially be revised. They don't have to be. If the rule is fine, nothing needs to happen. But you, it does rewrite the original program in such a way that all of the rules become abducible and allow the program to say this predicate in the body needs to go, or I do want a new rule to be added to my program in order to satisfy uh, the test cases. And also what it wants is to have a flattened representation so that all the variables are named properly across the whole program. So it can reason about uh, variables as well. So the designer specifies a set of rules and they get transformed using this fat flattening mechanism and looking at all of those, creating those abducible rules, such a way that you have your theory ready for revision. And then using that revision theory together with all the things you do not want to change on your program in such a way that your hypotheses, the outcome, the expected outcome of your multi-agent system can be induced. And that gives you a new program and gives you a set of changes that you could adhere to. 
So if we go back to our initial example, this is exactly the same code with the mistakes in there. I'm looking at all of those rules. Our revision algorithm will actually say, look, the first rule, the fourth rule actually did not account for special agents, VIP agents. Please insert a new uh, condition here. So if it's not a VIP, then downloading it should remove the permission to download another block. Remember that there was a problem with Alice downloading twice while she shouldn't have had. Then we also, our, the program also noticed that we had misnamed some of the variables that we had put in the wrong download variables in here. And also we had forgotten uh, a special rule indicating that there was misuse if there was a violation. So this uh, violation prudent was missing from our original program. And the revision theory would actually pick these ones up through it. So, so having that normative framework, being able from a software engineering perspective to revise that, theory, that um, normative framework in such a way that it does exactly what we do, we can validate and verify that it, at least that design time does exactly what we want to do. And if it doesn't, we can fix it. Uh, and that's sort of our, the whole setup of around uh, modeling uh, institutions in that way and normative frameworks. But then we notice that we can do it for random policies, random um, regulations. Why not look at uh, legal reasoning as well? And that came in collaboration with uh, Ken Sato from the National Institute of Informatics in Japan, who was really or is still very much interested in legal reasoning and making sure that declarative programming language can provide that support in terms of legal reasoning. So we started working with him and being able to formalize those legal reasoning processes and help humans or judges in this particular case, or businesses in terms of legal decision making. For example, summarizing legal documents, provide legal explanations, or suggest course of actions, depending on, and that's the long term goal. But that was sort of the thing, the model we started thinking about. And the things we've been modeling was, for example, contract law, def determining based on legal text on whether uh, people could legally get out of a contract and what the reasons why they could break the contract and dissolve the contract, looking at legitimate expectations. So even though uh, the transactions are still in pro progress, if you, let's say, buying a house and making changes already, when do you know, when can a potential seller legitimately expect the buyer to proceed with it rather than backing out? And different legislations will have different rules around that, but actually being able to formalize that was quite interesting. But then also looking at the integration of laws, looking at various aspects of local law being um, dismissed because there's a more uh, a higher law that prevails in certain contexts. So government law over local legislation, for example, or business regulations being superseded by national laws, for example, and how to find potential conflicts in that in, in those contexts and helping businesses or people to resolve those conflicts and actually making sure that the system they've built can be updated accordingly if laws change over time. And especially since the law is, is dynamic, new laws exist, new get added, existing ones get amended, and how can we make sure that uh, inferior laws get updated if superior laws get changed and finding ways of doing that. Um, and that's something we started looking at because we had that provision theory for just general normative systems. Can we put that into practice when we're starting modeling laws? And one example we looked at was uh, UK immigration law. Um, at some point recently, we the UK permitted uh, uh, students, overseas students to work up to 20 hours um, at some point, the university had uh, the idea that if you wanted a student ship, so money for your PhD, 
you would be required to deliver 30 hours per week of, of tutoring, teaching, being a teaching assistant. But of course, when the UK immigration law came into place, there was a conflict in that, in that setting. So all of a sudden the overseas students wouldn't be eligible anymore for their studentships because 20 hours and 30 hours don't correlate with each other. So could the university uh, change its regulation scheme such as it was two hours? Could we detect if we model this in such a way uh, that those two systems, those two no legal frameworks, normative frameworks could work with each other in such a way that they became consistent or can we automatically say that one of them needs to change. And that's where we start building what's called coordinated legal systems, where you have same time pattern in and then we started looking at different immigration law being dominant over whichever university regulations you have and finding a way of finding those legal conflicts as we refer to them uh, automatically and being able to adjust in this case the studentship regulation more easily more automatically and detect those conflict so we talked of, uh, so we have our uh, legal specification so we have in this case our uh, UK legislation and we have our studentship legislation so that would be what we tend to call a coordinated legal specification where we put all of those uh, normative frameworks together where there's a priority ordering and provide a wrapper around it so that they all remember with normative institutions as a state that keeps moving is to make sure that all of those legal specifications are in sync and have the same time step. That's why we call them synchronized traces. And we define two types of conflicts. We conflict. So that's if you have two uh, specifications where there's, uh, where there's a common fluent. So assuming they have some shared affluence, otherwise there can't be a conflict. If there's a shared conflict in which in one is framework, it's true. And in the other ones, it's false. So imagine you have the permission to do something in one framework but not in the other. And that's a weak conflict because ultimately it may not matter. You may not have necessarily a violation. If you never perform the action, nothing really happens. But then the other one is a strong conflict. It's a strong conflict where on the one hand, in one setting, um, you're not permitted to do a certain action, but the other institution tells you, you have to apply it because you're obliged to do it. So you know that you will violate, if you do the action, violate one or the other. If you don't do it, you violate the obligation. If you do do it, you violate the non-permission. So with weak conflict, you can avoid a violation. In strong conflict, you can't. And one way of modeling that is, as we see here, so weak conflict is where you have one where the fluid holds and the other it doesn't. Strong conflict, you have an obligation in one setting and not a permission in another. And then you can say, well, if we have our set of institutions, our set of normative systems, if we all put them together, we can have a, a trace. And in this case, if we're looking at resolving conflicts, we want to see, we want to have a constraint saying that whether we do want conflict and then detecting which ones are mistaken, but ultimately you want to check whether you don't have a conflict. And that's what we do here. So we have a constraint here saying that we want to check whether our system is conflict free. Unfortunately, um, the way I set up the example, there is a conflict. 
because in one of them you're allowed to work 20 hours in the others you're you're not allowed to uh, work 20 hours because you have to work 30 hours and that's where the conflict comes in and then using the mechanism of um, uh, conflict resolution as all theorem revision as we talked earlier we can eliminate that and tell university regulations that they have to change their their policy their regulation and make a difference for example between home students and overseas students or change it for all students and say well instead of 30 hours we now going to have a rule that you have to work 20 hours in there and then the ilp can provide all possible revisions from which you can choose what you do here and in our example here we've gone for the option that we make a distinction on whether a student is from overseas or not on whether certain things apply or not and that sort of set the scene for us to start thinking about compliance checking and that led to a project we're currently working on on looking at business policy uh, compliance um, in the context of GD, uh, the GDPR. Um, a lot, Ken Sato, our collaborator, was very keen on modeling uh, the GDPR and see how far we could take it in modeling it using um, install. Um, at the same time, uh, taking input from the business policy community, uh, we started using um, a language called ODRL, Open Digital Rights Language, as a way of modeling business policies and building a tool that takes ODRL specifications and semantics that we associated with it into install and sort of building a pipeline from going from the business policy into ODRL into ASB and therefore checking whether things is compliant or not. And then for GDPR do exactly the same thing and see how far we could push the nuances without interpreting um, the law, because that's the thing, if you start modeling it, you shouldn't be the, doing the interpretation. That's something lawyers should do, not people modeling it. And then we can start checking it for compliance. Is the business process as it's described and the steps it takes compliant with the law? Or if it isn't, what are the recommendations for change? How should we change the business policy so it adheres to the law? Uh, in this case, we used um, Article 46 as our uh, example. Since then, we've done a few more of them, which talks about uh, Article 46 talks about the transfer of data uh, subject to uh, what GDPR calls appropriate standards. And we started off taking the legal text and annotating them by color. So the pink ones, which are very hard to see possibly, are the parties. So within GDPR, they um, talk about the data control and the data processor. Then we have the actions. In this case, we are talking about transfer and different actions will have different legislation. And then blue stands for resources. What are we sharing? Personal data in this case, but also whether the company or the, the businesses, if you're moving between them, have appropriate safeguards to keep that data safe. And all the different safeguards the law provides, for example, a legally binding enforceable instrument, corporate rules, there's a whole range of them provided uh, by the GDPR, but also additional constraints that are part of that law for example, whether it's in a third country, because if it's transfer of personal data within the EU, different rules apply, or actually this is allowed, provided there's consent, but there are other rules if it's a third country or whether it's an international um, organization, for example. And using that sort of color change allowed us to start modeling things and creating um, our own um, template for ODRL, um, so using the, the ODRL standard, we created our own version of it by removing bits and pieces of it because it wasn't relevant. ODRL is digital rights language and missed certain of the deontic concepts you would expect from a 
from a broad and legal domain. And we talked about not just digital rights, but we have a lot more wealth of resources and a lot more actions we want to be able to model within that. And then build a translation from that ODRL profile, which we saw here, to our install and allowed us to model each of the terms and all parts of uh, the article as we went along. For example, whether it lacks certain uh, provisions, whether it supports something. So we, since we didn't know the business process when you start modeling it, you have to be able to account for whether there is support or whether there's a certain lack in order to be able to report back saying to the business, well, based on the process you've provided, yes, you're supporting these key features, but you like these ones in order to be able to say my business process satisfies um, GDP, GDPR um, rules on the basis of Article 46. And our ODRL uh, profile um, gets translated into, um, here we see um, Turtle, which is the semantic uh, web notation language, which then goes into uh, install for us. And if we have a business process here, which would be non-compliant, it's a company willing to um, transfer uh, data, but lacks a certain number of appropriate safeguards. And it can choose whether it's standard protection clauses or legally binding instruments. But for the moment, the way it's been provided up here, it misses a number of them and it tells the user which one would you like to provide. If it is compliant, this would be the one that you get back from our system. And it will allow the business users to see what's missing. And then using theorem revision, it will actually go back to their representation of their business process and potentially say, well, this is why you can slot it in. It still means that the business would have to make sure that if it's just an omission into the business process modeling, it's fine. But if it isn't, that they have to adapt their processes to make sure that they can put it part of the business process. So as a conclusion, I think over this whole period, and I think it sort of spans 10 years, we find that the ASV backend allows for quite a lot of flexibility. We've been doing querying, we've been doing models, we've been using I think both abduction deduction mechanisms in terms of theory revision, but also in terms of modeling, helping um, the agents in a multi-agent context reason about which actions they should do or shouldn't do in order to avoid certain penalties. Um, our install language has been very versatile. We've been using it as the example showing agents, laws, policies, um, looking a little bit at um, regulations at the moment. Uh, it provides interpretable and intelligible AI, so you can go back and see where the system is going missing and you can provide feedback to the user and it provides a starting point for human accountability or responsibility in socio-technical systems. And current work, we're looking at explainability, learning new norms, so looking at a whole society of agents, how can they learn new norms just like human um, societies evolve over time. We want to be able to see, can we do the same for virtual ones where we have software agents and looking further on the business process modeling as well. Uh, to end my talk, I really would like to thank uh, all the collaborators for the projects I've mentioned. There's, I hope I haven't forgotten anybody, but there's quite a number of people over the years who have contributed a lot of this work. Without them, I wouldn't be presenting this today. So thank you all. I'm not going to name everybody, but thank you very much. And questions are welcome. Thanks a lot, Marina. Uh, big claps from everyone. Team, if we can just switch on uh, the cameras, and I see already Burkhardt is holding his hand, so Burkhardt, Obviously, yes. start it. <laughs> Thanks, Marina. That, that was really interesting. Uh, and I, I love in particular how you deal with the evolution of normative systems and then how they try to sort out problems and then typically generate uh, new ones. My, my questions primarily, well, one is a very technical one. 
uh, how does uh, the language that you've chosen relates to things like LKIP and Legal Rule ML, uh, which had been designed by the community to provide exactly that sort of richer semantic framework. Um, and that can also be translated into defeasible um, reasoning relatively straightforwardly. But for me, more interestingly, I mean, I know Ken Sato's work quite well, and we've been on conferences a lot together. And he is, of course, an arch formalist, uh, an, an, an unrepentant arch formalist, that, that he believes, also when he has his legal hat on, there are right answers. The code provides right answers. Uh, they are mm -hmm. either right or wrong, and that, that's about it. Whereas I think the legal AI field got more responsive to the notion that legal concepts are typically contested and subject to argumentation. So this might be an argument that fly, but the other argument might also be relevant. And especially as you move up the hierarchy uh, that you described, uh, once you go beyond primary law, like, like the Immigration Act to the Human Rights Act that uh, puts constraints, you increasingly get that situation. That's I think by most, <laughs> most of the people in, in legal AI who are not Ken Sato move, move to, to the argumentation model that said we must preserve the internal, the inherent contestability mm -hmm. of legal rules or otherwise we are missing something that, that is really essential to that specific domain. I agree to some degree, yes. Um, I, we, we've, we've dabbled with argumentation and mm -hmm. not in this presentation. I, I think it, it does provide a, a nice way of doing things. We sort of looked at um, sort of narrative dialogues so where you can follow sort of more natural language like how the argument is structured and how you can defend against attacks. And I'm talking about in, in, the, in the argumentation sense of the word. Um, there is work with Ken about argumentation. I think he does occasionally go into that domain as well especially if it's around this uh, system of prolog. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yes, there is and some dialogue to be had, not in the, the argumentation sense of the word, between the legal profession and the people who like to formalize things a bit more and understanding whether there is some kind of give and take on both sides on, mm -hmm. on, on the spectrum on how we can formalize that a little bit more and demonstrate, look, if you do it like this, you get a, a straight yes or no answer, but mm -hmm. we can appreciate that in some cases that's not a possible possibility. Mm -hmm. Can we combine possibly both, which would be an interesting feature to look at. Mm -hmm. and, and so your first question about technical languages, I think a lot of the work we've been doing is sort of, as you described, a little bit organic. You start with something work on it, oh, we can also apply it in this area and things like that. A lot of the time, the reason for doing it the way we did is because of being able to put things together and having getting a, a sort of nice pipeline that ends up on the same system and you can slot things in. Mm -hmm. um, don't think I would argue that other systems would be worse or better or anything like that, mm -hmm. it's just the way Things have happened over the years, I think. No, I, I stopped making adverts for LKIP a long, long time ago. I mean, I, I, I realized that the vision to provide the one uniform framework for modeling laws in Europe never quite took off. But I, I, I was just wondering if there was more, more to it, more of a deliberative choice, which is perfectly fine. I mean, I totally agree that that the organic approach is, is very often. I, I think ultimately, maybe if enough companies start picking up this through business rules and business policies, you may see a bit more drive from industry to go from for system X because it provides nice tools and, and bells and whistles that industry needs, which mm. scientists probably don't care so much about because we want to do the new technology, the new invention. But when you're there in the companies, all the, the nice support does matter in terms of productivity and things like that. And I think that's where the push will come from, where ultimately it will be system something or another. Thanks a lot. Great. Matthew? 
Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, I guess I was had the question about the technical aspect of the revisions, of suggesting revisions for the uh, system. And it's a yeah, super cool approach. All your revisions seem to be very sensible uh, that it was suggesting that you gave examples of. In most logical systems, when you're trying to you know, invalidate some particular test state you know, that you've input to your system, it's giving you the wrong answer. The obvious rule is just to add a rule with no preconditions and just which just says that this post condition is invalid, right? I mean, there's lots of, basically what I'm trying to say is that there's lots of, there's loads and loads of silly rules that you can add to your system that trivially get you to the state that you want to be in, right? That how do you filter out silly suggestions, trivial suggestions from meaningful suggestions? Um, so we do get a number of solutions which are not sensible. I don't think because of those mode declarations, you already eliminate some of the uh, silly ones you're referring to. The ones okay. that wouldn't fit the specification of the input language. So by okay. setting those conditions that you shouldn't just add a random uh, constraint, for example, to just satisfy what you want or hard code your solution, that, that's okay. been taken away from by setting those mode declarations. So I, I think that's where a lot of the pruning happens already. That of course means that that technique only works if you have a language you know you're looking for and have a structure of the language that guides your search. Okay, yeah, cool. I see that we are now at the end of the hour and some people started to disappear. David and Luca sending their regards and thanking you for the talk, Marina. I mentioned to Marina that we have a Isaac breakfast uh, on at 9 a.m. tomorrow. So maybe if we wanted to discuss a bit closer of how we could apply her system and reuse her system within Isaac, then maybe tomorrow is a good time. But I see Manuel is holding his hand. So let's give Manuel a chance. Um, if Marina is still willing to come to Isaac breakfast, let's continue tomorrow. If you are not in Isaac team, uh, but still would like to come, just send me an email and I will send you a link how to join us uh, tomorrow. Manuel. Yeah, uh, it's it's a continuation of a uh, breakout question because um, you, you mentioned the, the need for legal interpretation. Um, and so I was wondering, so for me, the... the when you when you were explaining the way you you map the the policies with the business um, model, um, whether where does the 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 interpretation uh, comes? Whether are you able to model these the the interpretation that the different parties would would make? Um, so I guess that maybe it's, it doesn't necessarily apply to that level, but maybe it was at the, the legal level legal level, but. Um, what you could have is two two different interpretation that are competing. Do you model that? Are you able to model this, um, for instance, in the context of mapping a business model with um, policies? I think you could, if I understand your question, what we so if you come with the legal text, what we've tried to do is model the the legal text, not the business policies, but the legal text, as close to the way it's been described. So all of the concepts we try to use in our modeling for the legal text is as close as possible to that legal domain, rather than thinking, oh, I think I understand what this word means. Let's contract it and change it. It's actually using that typical legal language because depending on, on the legal profession that has a specific meaning and a different way on a different specific way on how lawyers would apply it. So we try to keep that. When it comes to business processes, then it's up to, to some degree to the, the company to interpret the legal text within their domain. So that's where then I think one could say they can apply interpretation. And then of course, it's up to the court of law on, to determine on whether their interpretation is valid or not. And that, that's, that, that's why choosing Article 46 is so extremely interesting. And I really would like to see more about that because on the one hand, it voids that or well, sidesteps that question because most of the Article 46 rules are if certified by the Information Commissioner's Office. So you simply have to ask, is there a certification not what does the contract say substantially? But 46 is also really unusual in that it has a consistency requirement. 
And you do not find that often in law. It's one of the very, very few primary laws that says, in order to maintain consistency in the overall system, refer back to Article 63, I might be lying about that. So, so it's one of the rare cases that you have in the object language of the law, a consistency requirement. I would really love to see how, you, how that plays out in your system. If, if, if that is, so to speak, that, that meta requirement is rendered with, within your model. Not at this point in time. I mean, uh, I think it would, for the moment, it goes back to a que query, not in the, the, the ASP sense of the word query, to the other legal text. And for the moment, we would then require somebody to put that thing, that requirement has been fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we've yeah. sidestepped it a little bit. Yeah, but still really interesting. Sorry, I'm getting over enthusiastic again. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. I have a few questions, but I believe we should stop now. I'll ask you tomorrow. I wanted to ask you a bit more on implementation and applications and AI, but I suppose that's probably now best to leave it until tomorrow. But but I will be able to attend the first bit of the breakfast meeting tomorrow. If Katie, if you can send me the link, that would be good. Uh, because after I think about half an hour, I need to go, unfortunately, to a board meeting. Yeah, that's OK. Avoid, which I'll, I would rather talk research. But... <laughs> right. Okay, that's good. Thanks again. That was a great talk. I hope we'll take some of these ideas forward, maybe even the whole implementation forward. Uh, let's let's see how it goes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very thanks. much. Thanks again, Marina. Thanks. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye bye.